Hello, everyone. Good afternoon from Southeast Michigan, from the Center for Middle East and North African Studies at the University of Michigan. It is currently 2.02 p.m. Eastern US time. I'm Muzum El Hussein, Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication and Media, where I work on global communication and comparative digital politics. I'm also the Associate Director at the Center for Middle East and North African Studies at the International Institute. Um, uh, in, to get our session going today, uh, I will perform three brief duties. Um, number one, uh, I'd like to tell our guests today, as well as our uh, uh, interested public that is joining us, uh, a little bit about our center. Uh, the study of Middle Eastern and North African region began at this university as early as 1889. Uh, but it was in 1961 that the Center for Middle East and North African Studies was formally uh, enacted, uh, signifying that the University of Michigan has been committed to area studies and language training for over six decades. Um, today, uh, our center is a designated comprehensive national resource center of the U.S. Department of Education, uh, which um, uh, is uh, and therefore the center is dedicated to promoting a broader and deeper understanding of the Middle Eastern North Africa region, its histories, its cultures, its languages, and its peoples through the efforts of research, education, and public outreach programming. Second, uh, one major uh, effort of that public outreach programming that our center does every year is in the fall, we have a fall speakers colloquium where we bring experts from around the country and around the world on a topic of interest related to the region. Uh, this fall, uh, uh, this fall's fall speakers colloquium is entitled Public Health and Pandemics Across the MENA, a multidisciplinary exhibition. Today is our fifth of seven program sessions. Uh, in previous sessions, we took uh, historical, institutional, gendered, and lexical uh, uh, ways of understanding the, the current pandemic, as well as uh, previous pandemics and public health issues in the region. Today, we will be focusing on psychological approaches to the topic of public health and pandemics in the MENA region. Uh, therefore, today's, uh, we also have a co-sponsor uh, for this event, uh, which is the College of Literature, Sciences, and the Arts Department of Political Science, uh, signifying at Michigan uh, one of our key strengths and keen interests in understanding um, public issues through the disciplinary perspectives of psychology and social, rigorous social scientific uh, methodology. Um, Finally, uh, in, or, in order to present uh, our, uh, introduce our guest today, uh, I'd like to go over a little bit of the parameters of the program today. Our program runs on Wednesdays, typically from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. In this two-hour format, we will begin first by hearing from our speakers prepared remarks that they have uh, for 20 minutes each. We have two guests today. Uh, then after 40 minutes of uh, listening to our guests and their prepared remarks, we will break for a 30 minute period of discussion with the public. Uh, and then we will have a final 30 minute session, uh, a more intimate closed door session with students that are enrolled in the session from our undergraduate masters and doctoral programs uh, at the university. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all today uh, to today's session where we will engage with our experts who have investigated deeply the topic of COVID-19 uh, in the MENA context from a psychological disciplinary perspective and a social scientific methodological approach. Um, this is some of the most current uh, and uh, highly relevant uh, scholarship that has been published. Uh, we are extremely delighted and excited to welcome our guests. First, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll be hearing from Professor Justin Thomas at Zayed University in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, he is a professor of experimental psychology with an interest in the interface between culture, religion, psychopathology, and well being. Second, we will hear from Dr. Ibrahim Aref Kira, uh, who is joining us from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Professor uh, Dr. Kira is a director of the Center of for Qu uh, Cumulative Trauma Studies in Stone, Georgia, uh, which, uh, which is also an affiliate of the Center for Stress 
Trauma and Resiliency at Georgia State University in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. His research interests focus on the dynamics of cumulative stressors and traumas and stressors and trauma proliferation. He is the lead developer of the Developmentally Based Trauma Framework, or DBTF, that focuses on the conceptual development and empirical validation of a conceptual paradigm on the dynamics of stressors and traumas, especially in multiply traumatized populations. He is the first author of over 85 articles and chapter books on the subject. Um, and for the students joining us, uh, uh, you have some exposure to both scholars for Professor Thomas's work. Um, Professor Thomas has recently published uh, some very current work on uh, the issue of positive religious coping and mental health in Muslim and Christian populations in response to COVID-19. And Professor Kira is co-author of uh, 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 another very contemporary recent publication on the differential mental health impacts of COVID-19 across Arab countries, a multi-state comparative study. Um, both of which use survey, I believe, survey respondents uh, for, for the work. So uh, very empirical and very co contemporary work. Thank you very much uh, uh, to both of you for joining us. Uh, Professor Thomas, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Okay, well, so thank you so much for that, for that introduction. Um, and I do have a few slides. I have a few slides to share with, with the audience, but I think if, um, I think just really to just to give a little bit more of a background and an introduction, I feel um, one of the things that might be useful to talk about is that the UAE during the early stages of lockdown. So in the early by early stages of lockdown in the UAE was April. Um, and again, for anyone who's not really familiar with the United Arab Emirates, um, the UAE's governance structure is the, the kind of highest policy making body in the land is the Supreme Council. And the Sup Supreme Council has the legislative and executive powers. So when the UAE locked down, like we really locked down and we locked down quickly. And we, it, there was, um, how to explain it, how to say, I think I would use the word stringent, perhaps. It was a proper lockdown. Uh, so a few examples, there was a curfew. Um, and if you were out after about eight o'clock, your, your phone, your mobile phones, an alarm would go off on your mobile phone. So you'd hear kind of a, a really piercing alarm. Where, where, where? If you were driving around, all of the speed cameras that were set to flash. So like where you would normally get a flash from the speed camera uh, for violating the speed restriction, you get a flash from the camera for, for being out after curfew, you know, with all of the associated fines that go with this type of thing. So, because I know in the, um, I know I've friends from other parts of the world and, and I know people's lockdown, we, we'll all use the same word lockdown, but the word I think has very different meanings and nuances in, in different places. I think if we were having a conversation at this point, this is where we'd, you'd start telling me about your lockdown and I'd tell you more about, about my lockdown, but just so you've got kind of a taste for it. Um, like there was nobody maskless. The rules say wear a mask. There's nobody maskless. The rules say being, you know, be off the streets before eight o'clock. There's nobody on the streets. Anybody who is going to be on the streets is going to be detected. And so that was just a little bit of background and a little bit of context. And our, I think like many social scientists and, and psychologists around the world, um, those changes, those rapid changes kind of ignited a curiosity in me, I really want to know what kind of, what are the implications of these rapid changes to people's lifestyles, these restrictions on freedoms, um, you know, and, and obviously all of the other things that were up in the mix, you know, fear of contagion, uh, panic buying in, in the store. So what was the kind of, psycholo what were the psychological implications of this? And I promised myself not to use the word unprecedented, 
But I think it was, I mean, that was that was a legitimate word to use. I won't use it again. But what what was, you know, a very kind of for most people, a once in a lifetime kind of experience. What were the psychological implications of that? I think that's where our research kicks off. So um, a basic survey methodology. I'm, I'm really going to talk you through two studies. One is the one that you've already been given to read. Um, and the second one, I'll kind of just I'll kind of I'll go through that one first because essentially it's a bit of a context setup. So the, the 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 big idea for us initially was just to kind of do if we could a, a nationwide survey, and particularly our interest was uh, you know mental health. So we had a raft of mental health measures. We were also part of a, an international consortium of uh, researchers who were all interested in COVID. So we had partners in Italy, uh, Ireland, the UK, Saudi Arabia, yeah, and we all used the same measures, slightly adapted for the local contexts that we were in. Um, and essentially, we all of us were psychopathologists, so we were interested in mental health. So we had regular mental health measures in there, sort of uh, post-traumatic stress, symptomatology, depression and anxiety. So they were our kind of, if you like, our dependent variables, the things we were interested in measuring with the idea that, you know, this is going to take its toll on public mental health. And we were also interested in demography and other psychological variables. So if you like, uh, candidate predictors of risk and resilience. So what were the, you know, if you like, who, who was likely to be most negatively impacted by all of this kind of change and all of this restriction that was kind of, you know, the nature of day-to-day -day life during that time. So our sample was, um, it was a convenient sample of about 2,000 people in, in the UAE. And again, if people aren't familiar with the United Arab Emirates, the, the population um, can be, it can be split in lots of ways, but it can be split in two primarily, into two, uh, residents and citizens. So the citizens are uh, known as Emiratis and they're like kind of generally or the vast majority will be of Arab, Persian, African heritage um, and Arabic will be the first language and in some cases maybe the second language and the religion will be almost invariably Islam. Then the other population is the residents and the residents are rather more mixed bunch but amongst those are um, migrant workers from other parts of the world so the US, the UK, our, our sample was quite biased towards if you call it the idea of, you know, kind of, um, I don't know if there's a better term for what people have historically called white collar workers. Yeah, that was our, our sample. So residents in relatively well paid jobs with access to the Internet um, and citizens of the UAE. And what we found, um, again, this was sorry, this was what was found in, in you know, kind of across our consortium and all of the different nations. I think the, fir the first thing, and it's obvious, was this, there was a spike if there was an increase the levels of psychopathology, depression and anxiety were higher than they were in community surveys that were done pre-pandemic. So there was kind of a before and after picture and there was a big spike in this lockdown, early lockdown period. Um, and this graph, just for, I guess for efficiency, the closer to the top, the bars at the top represent the factors that were seen as the, the highest risk. So the best predictor, I'm talking prediction in the statistical sense, the best predictor was being in, you know, Gen Z, being in the younger age group, 18 to 24. Second best was having, having had COVID or knowing someone close in your family with a history of mental health and all of them um, being female, seeing COVID-19 as an economic threat. All those ones with asterisks were statistically significant predictors. Um, and again, it's interesting to kind of carry on down that list and see some of the things that weren't. There were, there were no differences between being Emirati and non-Emirati, between people who were religious and non-religious in, in this particular study. This is a prediction of depressive symptoms. And we did the same with anxiety and we get the same kind of pattern of results. So we've kind of got a profile of kind of this idea that lots of people are suffering or struggling with higher levels of uh, psychopathology or symptomatology, at least of depression and anxiety. 
And there's a kind of a profile. These are younger people that seem to have these symptoms more and people who have been affected by the pandemic. So that was, and again, that was kind of replicated across all of the, of the consortium. So all of the other nations showed very similar patterns. So nothing to really stand out there. Um, and then I think just one of the other things I wanted to touch on was this idea of, um, we were able to do this too. Our survey was, we only had one phase, but many people have got multiple phased surveys. But even within our survey, we looked at those who responded early, the early responders, people who filled in the questionnaires in week one, and we split the sample into those who responded in week two. And even in that short window, there was a significant difference. The people who responded in week two, on average, the symptomatology was, 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 you know, was, was less severe than those who um, responded in week one. So there already seemed to be if you like a flattening off of the depressive symptoms. And other studies show this, they show this idea of an initial spike followed by, if you like, kind of situation habituation, a kind of a return to pre-pandemic levels of psychopathology quite soon after, you know, sometimes by phase two, which is a couple of months after the initial data collection. Lots of studies have shown this. Um, within, our, within our group that we looked a little bit deeper and I think the easiest, I, my maths is not good. I try to give a simple example of this, but the, the average, the mean that we return to, let's just say the mean, was, the mean um, the, let's just say the, um, the mean pre-pandemic was seven. Let's just be using the number. The mean depression score was seven pre-pandemic. Uh, and so when we, we, we look at the post-pandemic period, you know, once the kind of the initial spike is over, the mean again is back to seven, but the original seven was, you know, everybody had seven, 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 whereas post pandemic, it was a three, a seven and a 10. So this is the idea of dif different slopes for different folks. There were people that, there were people that certainly were worsening by time too. So there were people that got worse, people that stayed the same, and people that got better. So there's greater variance. So even though the means were the same, there was greater variance. So there were some people that were deteriorating. I think that's the that's the pattern that was detected across many of these studies. And that it's been published by um, Shavlin, a part of the consortium we were involved in. So we were interested in um, perhaps factors that helped people cope. What helped some people bounce back quickly and what factors might have been contributory in some people's deterioration. So one of the factors we, we, we looked in and focused in on, and this is the topic of the second paper, um, was the idea of religious coping. So again, I think in mainstream psychology, religion in particular has been for a long time, it was denigrated, it was seen as a delusion, a father fixation, something that is not worthy of psychological study because it's too subjective. So it was kind of largely ignored or studied studied in, in terms of quite a, a negative perspective, you know, looking at it as though it was a problem. Um, but I think there was lots of research that, you know, subsequently has shown that um, relig people from religious communities often have far better mental health physical and mental health outcomes. So again, in kind of recent decades, attention has been given to religion. Um, and and one, one idea in particular, so rather than just seeing religion, if you like, as a monolithic state, but the idea that the content of, uh, you know, religious teachings, the scriptural ideas, the actual content of these religious teachings can actually help some people cope, or at least it influences their the coping strategies in the in in the context of religion, uh, in the context of um, adversity, and one of the kind of so this was our study. Next study, we wanted to really focus in on this idea of um, it's known as positive religious coping, and again similar to the first study, just to see if it was predictive. Was this predictive of better outcomes in the context of the you know during the lockdown? were people who had high levels of positive religious coping. So not just people that were like the, the, the dichotomous religious, non-religious, but people who were actively using their religion in a way that was, um, if you like, a mechanism or a method to cope with the things that the, 
you know, the situation was throwing at them, the stresses of the pandemic. So on the screen, you can see a couple of items, all of the items from the positive religious coping scale. Just the idea of finding solace in one's religious belief and looking to higher powers for, you know, if you like, way to get through a situation or make sense of the situation, find meaning in the situation. If you like, take attention from perhaps the trauma and tragedy and focus the attention on uh, something, you know, um, transcendent, something bigger than oneself and the situation. In this particular study, we looked at, obviously we've got this really diverse population in terms of a religious groups. We focused in on Christians and Muslims because they were the biggest, two big majority groups. Um, um, one, of the, one of the first findings was the Muslims in our sample were uh, uh, relied on religious coping to a significantly greater degree than the Christians in our sample on every single item, the highest scores. And there were also different patterns there. And kind of to really bring this to culmination are uh, you know, the hypothesis. And this is, there's a, a long body of research looking at religious coping as a protective factor in, in other contexts. So, uh, you know, post uh, Hurricane uh, Katrina, there's some studies on that post the Oklahoma bombing. So there's lots of studies that have looked at religious coping in different contexts post divorce. Uh, you know, post uh, terminal illness diagnosis. So we're just kind of repurposing this in the context of the pandemic. Um, and th again, this is the little slight, slight twist in, in terms of the overall sample, re positive religious coping wasn't predictive of better um, mental health. But when we looked specifically at the Muslims, which is slightly more than half the sample, about 300 in this case, it was. So religious coping predicted if you like, people who had higher levels of religious coping um, had lower levels of depressive symptomatology, even factoring in all of these other variables like age and gender and education level. Um, so there seemed to be some, you know, there's seemed to be the, the association that's been found in other contexts before. It also predicted, um, it was also predictive of not having previously experienced a mental health problem that was true across the whole sample it wasn't it wasn't the case for when we looked at christians alone um and, but it was for uh, muslims alone as well so there was there did seem to be this protective or well, it's you know it's speculative but you know the evidence from our study supports the idea that um at least for some people in, in the context of the uae for certain faith communities religious coping did seem to offer some um, protection, possibly some protection, some additional resilience in the context of the pandemic. And I think the um, conclusions and interpretation of that is that positive, you know, one interpretation is that positive re religious coping helped people. It helped people make meaning of the situation, find solace, um, and if you like to bounce back quickly and stay well. And I think what our ex the, the explanation for why the and they're not um, the Christian group didn't is one explanation is a dose effect. So the the even though they were Christians, their re their reliance on religious coping was very low. Even if you looked at kind of norms in other Christian populations, so the use of religious coping was very low. So it might be that the, there's a dose effect. There needs to be a certain amount of it before there's any benefit. Um, and I think our final point really was that this idea that positive religious coping, you know, in the context of public mental health and public health in general, that we, we, we can benefit greatly from having a closer look at religion, religious coping, um, and, and perhaps, a, allowing or, or, or if you like using that to help inform you know some of the public health work preventative work uh, that we're trying to do around mental health especially in places like the UAE in the United Arab Emirates where uh, there are large 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 really active religious communities so I think that 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 was all I wanted to say. I don't know if I've gone rapidly under time, but I was expecting a 
I was expecting a, an interrupt at some point. Am I good for time? You're doing great. Uh, I've made the slight executive decision to expand our collective time by five minutes each. So if you'd like okay. to have any more, uh, you, you can speak for another six minutes comfortably, if you like. Uh, or, um, or you can I mean, I've paced myself, so I've got plenty more to say, but maybe that can come out in the, in the Q&A or the subsequent Perfect. sessions. But that was pretty much where I wanted to land. Well, thank you very much. I, I was uh, trying to take some diligent notes and it's been a very uh, enlightening uh, presentation. Uh, thank you um, very much, Justin. Uh, Professor or Dr. Kira, um, if you would share your screen, uh, we can begin with your presentation now. Yeah, this is okay. okay. Okay, you know, my, my interest here is really to see what are the effects of COVID-19 stressors on the mental health in Arab Americans, in Arab, in Arab countries. Uh, the studies of the impact of COVID-19 on the Arab countries are mostly limited to methods and the scope. Uh, within these studies, COVID-19, the independent variable that was, was mainly measured by single items or not measured at all. And they assumed that the results related to COVID-19. Most of the studies are cross-sectional and focused on one country or the other. And there are no large scale longitudinal studies on the trajectory of COVID-19 impact over time in Arab countries. There is a need of longitudinal studies that use robust measures for COVID-19 stressors and the sample Arab state within, within its different subcultures. The, call of, the goal of the current presentation of the current uh, is to share with you uh, a study, exploratory study. It is not completely longitudinal, it's quasi longitudinal and try to understand from it the impact of COVID-19 and the new global prolonged trauma on Arab countries. Uh, we'll start first by summarizing the study, then present in more detail the results. COVID-19, a new trauma type is global, a collective shared traumatic experience, multi-layered that includes fears of infection, economic uh, teardown, lockdown, lockdown stressors, and the grief stressor of those who, this loved one who died. With, the, with prolonged time scale that we never experienced before in our lifetime, COVID-19 really is a new experience for us. Our understanding of this trauma is still developing and it challenged our current conceptualization of trauma as events that happened in the past because COVID-19 is ongoing. And the coping with COVID-19 is ongoing sequelae in Arab countries. And this is understudied. We aim to explore COVID-19 sequelae and this impact on Arab countries and their coping with it. There are 22 Arab countries that vary in their level of previous traumatization, socioeconomic status, subcultures, geographic location, and the population density. We select seven Arab countries that present the different, the different very, uh, components of those uh, variants. And the seven, seven Arab countries consist of 35% of the Arab countries that represent this variation. 
we could uh, we should Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Palestine, Algeria, and Jordan. We conducted two studies on two times point on these seven countries. We collected data online using different platforms and networking methods at two times points. Uh, the first one was in between April and May to 20, uh, uh, 20, uh, 2020, and the second was in January to March 2021, with 10 months in between. We used the questionnaire that include measures, robust psychometric measures for COVID-19 stressors, and measure for cumulative stress, previous cumulative stressors and the trauma. And uh, uh, we measured also COVID-19 infection and hospitalization, PTSD, depression, anxiety, sub social support, resilience, wills to exist, live and survive, and interfaith spirituality. The first study included 1,743 participants. And second study included 2,265 participants. In both studies, we, just, we used ANOVA results. In both studies, ANOVA results indicated that the differences in COVID-19 infection, COVID-19 stressors, VTSD, depression, and the anxiety between the countries were significant. Post hoc analysis indicated in both studies that Egypt was significantly higher than all the other Arab countries in COVID-19 stressors, BTSD, anxiety, and depression, probably due, at least in part, to higher density, lower socioeconomic status, and the actual higher risk of infection. Hierarchical, hierarchical regression in both studies indicated that COVID-19 traumatic stress accounted for significant variance about, above and beyond the variance accounted for by previous cumulative stressors and trauma. In the second study, we found that the level of infection is skyrocketed, skyrocketed. However, the high level of BTSD and depression was almost stable or slightly increased, while generalized, generalized anxiety increased significantly with different tra trajectories in each country, depending on the start point. That means the country that start low in, uh, in BTSD will get higher PSD, PTSD, the start that have the start with the other country with higher point of BTSD, initial high point SD, will the, the BTSD will decrease or stable. Those countries with low start point increase, as we uh, explained. The level, we find the level of COVID-19 fears and the lockdown stress decreased over the 10, 10 uh, months period, it's, but still Egypt had the highest COVID-19 stressors, stressors in both studies. For coping resource resilience, social support and the wills to exist, to live and survive, they dropped significantly during this uh, period. However, interface spirituality was significantly higher in time two, higher in time two than time one. The results reflect in, increased adjustment over time to COVID-19 stressors, even with increased infection and hospitalization risks and probably much well more elevated uh, modes of, uh, of death from COVID-19. And the, the, uh, the, 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 but however, the role of the spirituality and potentially religiosity, but I'm not sure, as the default cubing strategy in Arab countries. The goal in the current study was to explore the longitudinal change in mental health and cubing Facing, facing the prolonged continuous traumatic stress of COVID-19. Uh, we shall go, go now to the details, the details of the study and the details of the result. 
for the first study, uh, as, we, as, we, as I mentioned, it included 1,374 adult participants from the same Arab countries, the Arab countries of Egypt, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Algeria, Iraq, and Palestine. The, same, the second study conducted on the same country, the same countries included 2,265 participants from the, seven, from the same seven countries. Details of the both samples, we can see, in the, we can see it here, as the uh, age from a range but from the first first sample the age range from 18 to 75 while the second sample the age range from 18 to 91 uh, gender 82 percent female in the first sample over, over uh, around 70 percent female in the second sample in second time second uh, sample education you can see in college students, six, around 70%, and the graduate student, around 24% from the, from the first, from the first uh, sample. The second sample closed 80% college level and the 91.1 grad, 91 graduate level. For marital status, you know, it's almost 50, Almost 55% single in the first study, while 60% single in the, in the second study. M married were around 40% and 33% in the second study. Employment, there is different in unemployment. Separate, you know, the first study, there is unemployment, unemployment, unemployment was 3.9. While the second study, the unemployed employment skyrocketed to 23.8%. Uh, the, the socioeconomic status, uh, you know, 75% was in the middle class. The second study was 83%, which most, most of the uh, are middle class, most of the people. Samples in both studies are middle class. Uh, 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 basically, what we did, we, we, we developed the surveillance. We, we, we followed the uh, snowballing method for collecting data by contact. And we, and, uh, we used the uh, email, Gmail survey link to their contact. And basically, we, the results have been downloaded in an Excel file through Gmail. And uh, this, is, this is part of the procedure of the study. And we can look now on the measure we used. We measured, the, we measured, we used the measure for COVID-19 traumatic stress. Uh, they included three types of measures. The measures, the fear of infection, and deaths from COVID-19 stressors, the traumatic economic stressors, and the, the lockdown and the isolation step between stressors. It's, it is a very well uh, validated uh, measure, previously validated measure, and we used it in both studies. We used uh, for BTSD, we used checklist for DSM-5, DSM-5, and therefore, uh, generalized anxiety, we use CAD 7. For, vision, for depression, we use the vision to health questionnaires. And all these measures are well, uh, well, 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 well uh, have a good psychometric in Arabic, in previously Arabic, and validated in Arabic sample. We used to measure it for. The coping measure we use the will to exist and survive measure, which you have, uh, which should be previously have been also uh, proved to have good psychometric properties in Arab countries and non Arab countries as well. We use the, the, the corner, the depth and resilience scale, 
We used social support scale, and we used the interface virtuality scale, the short version, that included four items that represented four components, direct connection with the creating the force, asceticism, meditation, and divine love. All, all measures have good reliability in both styles. We conducted descriptive statistics, statistics to explore the status of the main variable and the differences in infection and the hospitalization of both times one and two to compare and to compare COVID-19 stress around the infection, economic downturn and lockdown, as well as in PTSD, depression, and anxiety symptoms, and the coping uh, variable, uh, which is resilience, social support, will to exist and survive, is two times one and two. We conducted independent sample key tests to measure the significance of the change between time one and time two, which is this 10 months difference. Uh, this year here, here you, can, you can see the compare time one and time two, the infection in time in time one the infection rate was 2.3 for the seven Arab countries and in time two was 15.6 was skyrocket record. The hospitalization due to COVID-19 uh, in time one was 0.6 percent get higher 5.3 in time two. Uh, we we'll go through the each country, also the infection in each country. In time one, Nigeria was 2.8, increased to 13%. Iraq, 2.9, increased to 11.5%. Palestine, 3.9 time one, increased to 14.6%. Saudi Arabia was 1% in time one, increased to 14.2%. Egypt, was 1.1% in time one, increased to 17.7%. Kuwait increased from 3.9% to 15.5%. Jordan increased one from one to 16.5. And uh, uh, basically there was dramatic increase in level of inshaya infection and uh, of course level of hospitalization. We'll go to BTSD, how BTSD developed between one, time one and two. The, the, uh, the uh, main, main, main of the type one, which for BTSD is 25.54, and then time two is this almost close, 25.31. However, when we, we same, the same fact when we use the cut, cut of scores to the CEC 36% in the first, uh, in time first, time one, compared to 37.8 percent, a little bit increase, but not be not not big increase. It's just variance. Uh, for depression, the in time one 7.1 mean 7.91. 7 uh, time two 7.92 almost the same. However. When we use to cut up score, cut up cut of score, cut of one scores, we find there is some increase also in uh, some increase in depression. I'm not sure how we'll see how how it's significant or not. For anxiety, there is increase, increase in anxiety from 5.9, 4 to 6 to 4, a little bit of increase. And the, also when we use the cut off scores. This is really more significant, 6.6 .6 to 9.4. Uh, we go through the countries. You can see the countries COVID-19 infection, fears, the fears of infection have decreased from Algeria 13.9 to 11, Iraq 14.8 to 10, Palestine 12.9 12 to 11.5, Saudi Arabia 11, a little bit. You can see here, Saudi Arabia, the, the uh, start, the, the initial bond was lower than the average, but start the increasing the second in the time too. However, most of the countries in the 
uh, and fears of infection decreased. Economic stressor, there's some decrease and some increase in some countries, depending on how, how they start. The, uh, for COVID lock, lock, lockdown, the effect of the stressors, it is decreased all over the countries from 11 to 9, from 12 to 9, from 11 to 10. Uh, then it did increase basically COVID 19 uh, stressor lockdown, stress, I feel it perceived the stressor lockdown dropped on time too. BTSD uh, across the countries, you can see the, the countries who start to know increased, but it's getting get it high, decreased. But in the same time, there is no that much. Uh, very, very variability in DB uh, PTSD. Depression, we can see some slow, some high between Algeria, Iraq, Egypt, slow, lower. Uh, Kuwait, the same. Uh, total, basically, they're almost the same or high, but we see how it, this work. If it is this is significant or not. They say the, the anxiety you see in Algeria here uh, increased, Iraq increased, Palestine the same or decreased, Saudi Arabia increased, Egypt in decreased, uh, but Kuwait increased almost basically. There is variation between the countries, but the average is increased general anxiety. Professor well, Kira, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is just a reminder. We have about four and a half minutes remaining. Okay, okay. you will see that you know we see that you see where to exist and survive, resilience, social support, all of the three we find it across the countries have been decreased. I mean the ability to survive, to be resilient, to get social support, which makes sense, which because when you get, when you get under lockdown, there is no uh, that human contact, then your social support is decreased. Well, in interface visuality, you can see increased, increased, increased in most of the countries. Uh, the spirituality, we go to spirituality, what kind of increase in spirituality? There is the, the spirituality, I think my feeling, feeling of direct connection with my creator significantly increased. I meditation, meditation, and meditate about the miracle of creation and meaning of existence generally increased there. Uh, however, the divine love and the modesty being realistic and knowing the real value of me didn't really uh, the, especially the modesty didn't increase or decrease that much. Uh, basically, we we see how this result are uh, significant. We find the for the for the independent sample t test to find that the the difference between time one and time two in infection and in, in, uh, fear of fears of future infection is dropped significantly. Economic stressor dropped somehow, but not that big. The lockdown stressor dropped significantly. And the, but BTSD is almost the same, depression almost the same, and in generalized anxiety increased. Uh, for resiliency, you can, you can see resiliency has been uh, decreased. Somehow, somewhat, social support decreased significantly. Wills to exist and deliverance by decrease uh, significantly. While interface virtuality increased, highly increased. Uh, you can see also from those that this uh, feeling direct connection with my creator increased very highly. While meditation, meditation, meditate about the miracle of creation and the meaning of existence increased 
significantly, but the other one is not the modesty then the kingdom decreased while described love actually decreased a little. Conclusion, the negative impact of continuous COVID-19 stressors may be eroding traditional coping strategy of social support, resilience, and the wills to exist, live, and survive. While PTSD and depression did not seem to increase or decrease significantly over time, they are still very high and the anxiety increased. The decrease in, the decrease in perceived COVID-19 different stressors type uh, may reflect adjusting over time. The results are consistent with a longitudinal study on Singapore that found that it decreased the perceived stress while no difference in PTSD. The rise in interface spirituality will be an important default coping mechanism to COVID-19 continuous traumatic stress after the possible erosion of traditional coping strategy of resilience, social support, and the ways to exist and survive. Intervention should focus on enhancing, optimizing wills to exist and survive social support and resilience, and the capitalizing on interface spirituality, in addition to the evidence based uh, and the transit diagnostic intervention with PTSD, depression, and the anxiety. There's a cautionary note here, this limitation to this study. The samples were convenient samples and not representative of the population under investigation. The samples were overwhelmingly female, college educated, and the middle SES, social, social economic status, we may Professor, have Professor Kira, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but uh, this concludes our time. Uh, perhaps we can uh, discuss this slide in particular in the discussion portion when we can we'll get into the methods and limitations. Thank you so much for such an uh, informational uh, presentation and such an expansive study. Um, Kristen, could we please uh, bring both our panelists back in for the public q and So as a reminder to all our audiences, uh, we will now begin uh, for approximately a 30 minute discussion. If you are joining us uh, from the public or the classroom, please make use of the Q&A tool on Zoom and direct your questions either to both experts or to specifically to uh, individual experts uh, by, by name. Uh, and I will uh, pull from the Q&A tool and direct the questions verbally. Uh, Professor Kira, could you do uh, one thing, please? Please stop sharing your screen so that we can see both uh, of the um, panelists. Perfect, I think that worked. Kristen, did that do it? Okay, perfect. Now, it may take a minute or two as people type in their questions. Um, I wanna thank again, both of you for uh, presenting your number one, very contemporary studies by any social science standards, I think. Uh, I'm from a discipline that uh, is quite interdisciplinary. We have uh, humanistic as well as social scientific or more generally regarded as the quantitative and qualitative traditions. Um, but um, typically it's, it's quite a challenge to be able to address a current event and have an, a peer reviewed publication out uh, at the same time that it's still unfolding. So uh, I am personally uh, quite curious about um, what doing a very contemporary and very relevant scholarship looks like uh, from a behind the scenes perspective. Uh, Dr. Kira, you discussed a little bit about the uh, large team uh, that was vital for distributing the research. So here's a broad question for both of you. Uh, Justin uh, and Ibrahim, would you please share um, one or two notes about uh, how this, the research, the, the study began, uh, when it began and what was involved that was perhaps different uh, in this iteration uh, as compared to situations where there was no pandemic driving the, the study. What was different in doing this, this particular study as opposed to a non-pandemic study? You want to start or? Justin, I think I saw your hand. Uh, 
if you had I don't mind yeah no it's a, it's a great it's a great question and I, I just started to reflect and, and, and think back to, to that time and I think I mean in terms of a comparison with the way I would normally work I think it was for me it was far more collaborative I had far far more collaborators in this particular piece of, of research and I think in terms of the time frame for me I think there was something about being in in lockdown that kind of facilitated productivity and focus you know so there was a, a for me I think because I would normally you know contemporary event uh, I wouldn't normally turn around from you know data collection to analysis to write up in, in the kind of speed because uh, we published a lot of papers in that very kind of short lockdown window that's one of them um, but yeah I think it, two things really was the, the collaboration yeah, broader collaboration because everyone was interested in this. People left off what they were normally interested in to collaborate. And I think the second issue was just that, that, that you know, we weren't teaching classes face to face. We weren't commuting. And there was that kind of singularity of focus and, and time to be able to devote to, to research um, and I guess produce it in, in quicker speeds than would normally be the case. So that was my story. Very interesting. Yeah. Dr. Kira. My story is, uh, we started actually in, in Georgia State University, we have a team of three, we are addressing from trauma and the effects of trauma. And when the COVID started, we, we realized we are really dealing with a new trauma type never been experienced before. And the really way we have meeting on the internet, in, uh, during uh, February and March, and we designed a big study in the United States, and everybody can get collaboration from his uh, uh, his con contact in others. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have a lot of contact in Egypt, Kuwait, and the other countries, and we able to be able to be able to do to uh, recruit really good collaboration team in this countries, And we, uh, that is basically it. And I thought, yeah, this collaboration and the planning, and the good planning. And you have issue about what you are, what you are living in right now is something new, we never experienced it before. And we have to address it, we have to understand, it. we have to, have to deal with it. That's what the day really, the, uh, the incentive, the strong incentive of the drive to do this kind of research. We did this research not only in Arab countries, we did in Pakistan, Turkey, uh, South Korea. We did a lot of, uh, but this is only one part. And we published almost in the last, uh, in the last 70, 16 months or 15 months, we published over 12 articles on COVID-19. So, so what you're, uh, if I understood that correctly, this data set that you described that went out through a Google form that was shared in various country contexts was sent to more than the seven countries that you describe here, but the, this particular publication draws on a subsample of a larger database. Is that accurate? Yeah, exactly. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Justin, what was, uh, just as a follow-up then on this particular thread of discussion, uh, did you also deploy your survey through um, online uh, or did you already have, um, uh, you know, certain captive audiences like classrooms of students who, you, uh, you know, that, that you surveyed? Was your population uh, students or was it more general public? And how, was, how did you send your instrument out? Yeah, I think that, that connects to the previous questions. Well, there are a couple of other a couple of other things that were quite instrumental in, in making expediting the process. One was um like the um ethical review boards, so the kind of you know human human research subjects, kind of ethics review boards, internal review boards, um, you know, kind of had this uh, fast track for COVID-related studies. And in, in our context, and to answer the other question about the participants, we, um, we were able to 
get support from in the UAE there's something called a national program for well-being so it's a government office um, and they have in in most governmental entities they have something called um, a well-being officer or a happiness officer um, and so we were able to use their email kind of network to, to reach all of these different uh, agencies government bodies and universities as well. So the sample, it wasn't a representative sample. It's quite difficult sure. to do that in the UAE, but it was a fairly um, widespread and lots of different walks of life. I think the other thing, and this is this was unique actually, what we what we found was that people who'd completed the survey would, would send us emails, a thank you email. Thank you for that. That was really interesting. That was that helped me. You know, the, the survey covered lots of things. It covered loneliness, it covered resilience. It was a really long survey. Um, and, and people were, I think, were, were quite happy to participate. And I guess they felt like they were doing something. There was a sense of camaraderie and helping out and being part of a solution. I don't ever get that with normal research or I, other I, research I, that I've done. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I think I think absolutely I agree that stands out as a new uh, behavioral response to being engaged for, you know, data collection. Um, uh, and, and, and it seems to kind of resonate with my own memory of uh, observations about where everyone that I was connected to was looking to find and build agency. Uh, I come from a faith community itself. So those individuals turned as many of the subjects of your study to their faith. Um, and, and engage deeper in um, contemplation, prayer, and connecting with their faith communities. Others turn to their, you know, primary toolkits, as it were. So the, my research communities turn to their scholarship, and uh, those invited into either, you know, uh, life worlds, let's say, uh, were happy to be asked to do to do something other than to be locked down and to feel helpless to either contribute themselves and their experiences to be studied or to somehow via social distancing participate in a faith practice uh, to, to bring um, content and meaning into their, uh, I guess, lockdown status. I don't know if that uh, resonates from your different situations, either in Atlanta or in Abu Dhabi or the uh, yeah. various communities you know, that you studied. Yeah, under COVID, under, co under COVID, everything became virtual. There is no schools, no universities. Then using the internet, using the survey, online survey was the only way to actually access your subjects. This is a fact, basically. Mm -hmm. Then uh, under COVID-19, this you, you cannot go, there is no mosque open, everything is closed. No church open, no, uh, no university open. Very everything was virtual at least 10 months that we studied between the two studies. Yeah. Yeah, but basically this was the... Yeah, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's quite, I think, um, complex, but, but still very interesting to look back. What is it now, a uh, year and a half, two years? Uh, how, how quickly the situation has shifted, evolved and grown and how people have come to um, become resilient or find tools to be, to be resilient, but also it's a complex story. And, and both of your studies bring, put a lot of detailing into that understanding. Um, I have a question to pull in from one of our audience members. Uh, for Justin, um, uh, from, uh, this question is from Andrew Williams. Uh, you mentioned that for others, the topic of comparing religions was subjective. Does the use of coping bring that this comparison of coping will become normalized for addressing religious affliction in the aftermath of a calamity? I can restate the question if helpful. Yeah, please do. I, I missed it. There's a chunk I missed there. Yeah, so it's, um, there's two or three parts to it. So the first is a context. You mentioned that for others, the topic of comparing religions was subjective. And the question begins, does the use of coping bring an indication that this comparison of coping will become normalized for addressing religious affliction in the aftermath of a calamity? It's a great question, and I think for me, I think my uh, my 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 original statement was um, was I think the idea that psychology 
um, for, for a great part of the 20th century at least, kind of ignored like if you think about what shapes human behavior for many people in many communities one of the biggest shapers of their behavior one of the biggest shapers of the way they think about the world is religion is the you know their the religion shapes their behavior it shapes their attitudes it shapes their thinking and for a long part of western psychology's history it's kind of ignored psychology or seen it as not being um, worthy of study, perhaps because religious experience is subjective. So I think that's that's what I meant by the statement about the com the comparative part. I don't I don't I don't quite follow that element of the question, but I do think um certainly in the last few decades, psychologists have really, really kind of change their attitude towards religion and i think part, one of the benefits of that is you started to see um you know um beyond just looking at religion as their religious people and correlate that with certain outcomes this idea of actually looking at the content the cognitive kind of the beliefs some of the specific beliefs some of the specific teachings and practices uh, and particularly my area that I'm interested in well-being and psychopathology and how those specifics uh, might actually be connected to, to better health and mental health outcomes for individuals who do have their particular faiths. I, I'd be more than happy to, to say a little bit more but I, I don't know if I properly, properly addressed the question but it might have been born of a misunderstanding of what I was saying about um, why psychology is kind of, I don't want to say ignored religion, because there's William James back in history, but for a long time, a lot of the literature on, on a lot of the psychological literature on religion was focused on things like it's, you know, as conceptualizing it as an obsession, delusion, father fixation. There was not so much of a positive um perspective or a constructive perspective in terms of looking how it actually shaped people's behavior and ways of thinking and being in the world? I mean, it's a, it's a complex question to engage in. I think part of the structure you provide in your response is thinking about um, the inevitability perhaps of some disciplinary determinism, that we think through the borders and constructs of our disciplines and certain phenomenon make us question whether we need to move those, those barriers in or yeah. open or expand things for, for new ways uh, to accommodate. Um, I, I wonder, you know, listening to both of your talks today, you know, uh, Ibrahim, you presented a scale the interfaith spirituality scale, uh, and I don't have, my, my notes were not quick enough to capture all of the uh, sub-dimensions of that scale, uh, but um, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know how connected that topic is to the question Justin just responded to, but do you have thoughts on, or, or some further in, uh, reflection on how you operationalized uh, spiritual faith, uh, whether that particular scale uh, though reliable in your test, is it um, does it capture all of the different ways one is religious in the different religions that you may survey? Um, yeah, I imagine in both of your studies, you're probably uh, you know uh, sampling primarily in monotheistic or Abrahamic uh, faith settings, even more particularly. Uh, but faith and spiritual spirituality exists. Uh, I think, as Justin is alluding uh, uh, frequently all over the world, even though our disciplines may be a little uh, confounding, confoundedly sort of ignorant of it to some extent. Yeah, interface, interface spirituality, we, it, uh, we developed this skill a couple of years ago and we published in the Journal of uh, Religion and Psychology of Religion, Spirituality. And uh, it, uh, it has four dimensions. The direct connection with God, divine love, meditation, to meditate about the creation, and the, the asceticism, which includes modesty and being accepted yourself as you are, 
this is not the, the, the this is kind this is the fourth dimension of it. The our our results actually uh, in this study found that the the coping mechanism of his social support, traditional ones, social support, uh, resilience, wills to existence, but have eroded, you know, probably due to the stressors, the continuous stressors, prolonged continuous stressor of COVID-19. But the what happened is the default coping strategy here is the spirituality. Interface spirituality, regardless of being Muslim or Christian, have been have been uh, have been became bigger, became more more stronger. Kubi, Kubi, it is for for you know my 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 comments that it the, the it is the religion and the spirituality is the default to Kubi for human when there is nothing to Kubi to help them more. This is the, basically what we found and what we understand from the results in empirical studies we find in this uh, seven countries. So, so that that scale is uh, created by the res your research team or the your interlocutors uh, that you work with. Then, um, uh, is that accurate? Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. I, I was just excited to see it. You know, in 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 my own. Um, uh, social science uh, research background, you know, five, eight years ago now, there used to be a lot of interest in measuring religiosity in political communication settings. But I don't think I ever encountered a reliable method to measure uh, religiosity in our disciplinary uh, uh, areas, uh, because it was typically boiled down to behavioral attributes. You know, it's not religiosity, because religiosity has different dimensions. Right. We going to mosque, we want to create a church, yeah. and uh, they're not necessarily, you know, person. Sometimes they are not religious, but they are. They can be spiritual. Under mm -hmm. the stress, it became okay. I, I need something higher than me, power, mm -hmm. higher power than me, regardless of the religious uh, orientation. And uh, uh, during the COVID nineteen, the the church was closed, the mosque was closed. The, uh, there is no like uh, Friday prayer in the mosque was not there. Mm -hmm. Then the, the the actual traditional relig religion was actually not as strong, but the, the spirituality was still there. It, I mean, it didn't go. It actually mm -hmm. increased. That's uh, yeah. I, I didn't. We didn't major religiosity. We major religiosity in time two, but not in time one. Then I cannot really talk if there is a change in religiosity, yeah. negative or positive. Um, I'd like to ask a question uh, or drive the conversation at least uh, to the issue or the topic of now, both of you are, are psychological researchers. Uh, you try to understand, you know, from a very broad approach here, um, you try to understand how people make sense of and cope with by making sense of what's happening around them. Uh, in doing so, in the conversation itself, you've reflected on structural issues of what's happening in societies, you know, um, movement being uh, limited, uh, in, you know, uh, economic, macroeconomic uh, uh, shifts happening, which cause great anxiety to at the individual level. Uh, but Perhaps there's a meso level here as well, which is um, people were forced inward uh, into their um, uh, away from public settings. But I would imagine they found themselves reconnected to um, other sociological constructs like family or close friend circles or dormitories. Uh, so I don't know if uh, um, I think. Let me boil it down to a question. Uh, how how have you, has your research reflected on or engaged with um, you know uh, social constructs like family or friendship or kinship being reintroduced or reemphasized in what people experienced with the lockdowns and the pandemic? Okay, there is, I mean, there is a lot of research that the lockdown was associated with increased child abuse and domestic violence. Then it affected negatively. It was mm. it was not a good effect, basically, on the on the family or the uh, 
uh, a family or the children, basically. Uh, th and that's why we found that social support decreased during the uh, COVID, 10, 10, 10, 10 months of COVID. Wow. Decreased social support the, uh, significantly decreased. See. And of course, social support is part of the resilience. It's part of the resilience part. Then social support decreases the resilience also support. And that's what we found. Mm -hmm. And this is what have what did the what did what is the what is the other option than spirituality and religion probably I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting. I, I almost take it as an elephant in the room type of answer that. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, it's not the first week, in fact, that I'm hearing this perspective that the COVID impact uh, in the Middle East, at least in cases we've heard of it in previous sessions, of this colloquium had a direct negative impact on children and women uh, because of economic co consequences, increased um, load bearing from familial responsibilities, emotional responsibilities and risks of uh, how, how the pandemic affected primarily frontline workers who are typically of one, you know, uh, 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 female. Uh, so nurses, uh, care, primary care providers, uh, all of which can obviously connect and impact the family as a structure as well. Uh, Justin, do you have any thoughts on this, you know, discussion thread? Yeah, definitely. I think in the context of the, the UAE, you've got two very, very different uh, family structures in terms of the two, the two main groups. So um, like amongst among the Emiratis, you have the, so the citizens of the UAE, you have um, relatively large families. We, so this is sort of a variable we measured number of people per household. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the I can't remember the details, but you have the, you have much lar larger family groupings, uh, and it it you know pre pandemic times these are families that would then meet with the larger family group each Friday. And that's a you know a, a, a ritual you know it's a routine ritual type thing so all of that's uh, disrupted but I think and one of the things we we looked at the idea of um, if you're living in a house with ten other people your risk of infection is higher you know more people per household increases um, the risk so I think that was a potential. Um, correlate of kind of COVID nineteen fear of infection and anxiety, but I think on the on the other side you've got these families that you know the families that have come to the UAE to work and they're disconnected from their extended family. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean the point that um, Dr Ibrahim made about social support kind of withering and dying on the vine. You kind of had that, and I think the the other exacerbating factor about people who were, you know, you know, migrant workers who were distant from their families um, in other countries. We looked at um, healthcare workers and and um, migrant workers in the UAE who were uh, from Italy. You know, when and Italy had a really kind of um, high it's death rate at one stage. Yeah, yeah. And so the, these were people that were kind of getting all of that information, mostly most of it via via the media, and the, you know at real distance from their loved ones, um, and the communities that you know the communities they grew up in, and they're living in this place that's you know and there's obviously no air travel, no means of physically going to see people. So yeah, so I think you've got a lot of um, you know um, obviously use of technology to connect. To keep families connected, but two very in the UAE context, two very different stories yeah. kind of juxtaposed side by side. You know, just as a very casual kind of mental exercise, I'm, I'm you're making me think. You know, pandemics have happened before, uh, not obviously at this scale and to the ex extent that we experience in a highly globally connected and digitally connected world. But I wonder what the psychological experience of living through a pandemic in times where you couldn't very quickly email in text and find out what was going happening. In my own experience, you know, I'm, I'm South Asian by origin. We still have much family all over the GCC countries and in uh, across South Asia. And um, anytime anyone got COVID, we would find imme out immediately. Anytime someone passed away, and we, we've had you know, more than a handful of, of that as well, uh, you would find out. And so it really sort of puts you on edge immediately. No time for processing. 
only for reacting or at least just absorbing uh, in, information overload. Uh, and, and, and I wonder to what extent uh, the qualitative difference of the way that we're connected exasper exacerbated the, um, the, the way that we experience and made sense of the a pandemic. Uh, do you have any, actually, there's a question there. Uh, how does your research account for the mediatization of a pandemic? And what we mean by that, at least in my field, is, um, uh, you know, from a health communication perspective, uh, how do you think the information that we have, the constant uh, information about every nuance of the pandemic shaped the type of dependent variables and outcomes and hypotheses that you design and test? You know, that, that triggers me to, there's the study we did with the Italian, uh, with the people, um, you know, that living in the UAE, originally from Italy. Um, again, we, we definitely hit upon, I can't remember the exact finding we had, but the, the easiest way to explain it, it was something like the, 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 the scenario that we have is this idea that someone's calling home in a panic and the people they're speaking to back in the homeland are saying, what's wrong with you? It's bad, but it's not that bad. Mm. You know, so I think the, the point about the, you know, kind of um, when your only kind of, when you so, your direct source of information is the media, if it bleeds, it leads, you're seeing the worst possible pictures of, of the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think that fans the levels of anxiety in those, you know, members of the community who are, you know, disparate, uh, you know, at distance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we definitely saw that there was an actual finding and the way we interpreted it was because it was counterintuitive. Like, why would the Italians in the UAE be more stressed than the Italians in Italy? Yeah. You no, know, because they're not they're not hearing, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing a concentrated mm -hmm. vision of, a, you know, um, you know, catastrophe, you know, on a loop on the news, whereas mm -hmm. the people in, on the ground it's it's bad but it's 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 diluted by you know scenes of no normalcy as well and and everyday you know life mm -hmm. yeah i That's just have a comment someone's first comment on that you know the the uh, the media and the globalization is that can be positive or negative depending on how we use it and it is it is something positive in our life even with COVID-19. But we, if we misuse it or you, uh, misuse it, then it comes back on us. What we did, we measured actually the effect of exposure to social media and to other media. Okay. And they, they, if they, you know, they basically who, who overused the social media uh, uh, during COVID get more stressors and they became more stressed. While those who this the were middle or didn't overuse it would actually better off. Then it depends how you use it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. there is some people who overuse it, social media and the communica communication, or misuse it, then it can be very uh, you know, it can be very negative, have negative effects. Okay, you know, the more you exposed to COVID the stressors. During, through the media, you more get more stress. I see. Well, um, I think we have time for one more uh, question and discussion thread. Uh, and I'd like to pose the question to um, Ibrahim first. Uh, although, Justin, you also presented or uh, discussed this topic early in your question, uh, in your remarks. So the, the question or topic is, uh, Ibrahim, uh, the populations that you surveyed, the nation states uh, and, and countries where you uh, deployed your survey, are all generally, I think, recognized to have large youth populations, young populations, um, what I think maybe Justin would call uh, 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 Gen Z uh, generation or the, the most recent generation. Uh, uh, how... Um, what are some unique experiences there from your study uh, that uh, we should take note of? Uh, because that is the, the uh, these regions have some of the largest young populations experiencing this. Um, is it a story of um, you know uh, heavy media use, uh, or, or is that the unique feature that's affecting them? 
Uh, is it, uh, are you also noticing high levels of depression? Are those correlates somehow? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for your unique perspectives or thoughts on uh, Gen Z generation or the youngest generation that is quite young and large in population uh, in, in your areas of study. Yeah, as, uh, you're right. The uh, young generation are more active and more responsive and more sensitive at the same time to distress. Uh, in the same time, when COVID came, there was a lot of uh, political turmoil, for example, in Egypt, in Arab Spring countries. And the, the, who was actually more involved in this was the young people. And, the, uh, and there was trauma, for the after trauma from the Arab Spring traumas and the oppression traumas, discrimination, whatever, and then COVID-19 on top of that. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you can expect them to be more sensitive and more uh, traumatized, more have probably have more PTSD than the older one and the age. The age and the older one have less, older one have less PTSD, have less anxiety, have less depression, not necessarily depression, but anxiety and PTSD. Then it is, uh, uh, and this is the new generation that is leading on this, uh, on the Arab world. And this is, uh, they are traumatized. They are more traumatized. Oh. I'm, I'm sure I answered the question. You did. I mean, certainly I, uh, I'm fascinated by your perspective on multiple traumas and layered traumas, and certainly it's a longitudinal perspective. Uh, and you make me think about recent history, recent past, global recession, Arab Spring, political changes, political context, yeah. and then on top of it, a pandemic. So that's a complex <laughs> life to have, especially for, for young. And that if that's all you've experienced, that certainly leads to, I think, the type of outcomes that Justin was speaking of. Justin, turning to you, do you have uh, any follow-up or further reflection on this issue? Yeah, I honestly, I honestly think it's one of the one of the really most one of the most Im important questions of, of of the moment is you know Jen, and this is this I think this is a global question. I know even in the data that we we were we were working with people from Spain, Italy, Ireland, the UK, Saudi Arabia, every single study that you know every single study I've looked at. Uh, the being in the younger age group was a uh, you know was associated with higher rates of depression and anxiety, and, and you can see this in study after study. The, the Gen Gen Z are described as you know the most depressed generation ever high, since you know since we started you know quantifying things like that, and I, I think there's just it's a it's a huge and an important question, and I, I agree with Dr. Ibrahim about you know, layered traumas, and I think issues of employment in the Arab world, particularly, I mean, I've not, well, I know that the, the, the kind of 25%, World Bank suggests 25% unemployment across the MENA region. Um, and I think that on top of that, then you also have, I mean, this is, you know, it more in an intuition than a kind of an evidence-based idea, but a kind of, um, I think it, it's, it's, I think one of the one of the ideas is what you're seeing in the future. You know, what 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 kind of future do you see for yourself? Um, and I think there's 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 some research that supports this that during the Cold War, so people about my age actually, when we were young, mm -hmm. you know, you started to see this idea of, of night terrors. There's going to be some kind of nuclear Armageddon. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and kind of a big, big piece of research looked at that and that kind of, you know, people suggested that lay behind uh, impulsive behavior, drug use, nihilism. And I think you've got you've got similar, you know, you've got I think you've got compounded dynamics because the, the threat of, of wars and nuclear annihilation hasn't gone away. And on top of that, you've got issues, major issues, threats to the future like climate change. And then on top of all that, We've named this generation Generation Z. What comes after Z? I hadn't thought and about social that. media. Let's throw social media in there as well. Like this is a generation yeah. that's grown up on social media. So I think I mean it's huge. I think there's there's lots of layers and strands, but I think it's yeah. one of the 
one of the most important questions of our age is why yeah. why are so many of our young people um, so deeply anxious and unhappy? And, and as a con uh, concluding connective thought, I, I so appreciate in both of your work, uh, a kind of a revitalization um, of a longstanding use of religion and spirituality to make sense of uncertainty. And uh, it's, it's fascinating to see in both of your scholarship uh, an empirical effort to measure and see the impact, whatever it is, uh, of, of uh, perhaps a tool that uh, humanity has used over time uh, to navigate uncertain periods. So uh, I, I see a fascinating uh, old and new coming together. Uh, and so I thank you both for your prepared remarks and engaging with the public a question in a period.